The movie begins with a brave rabbit named Peter meeting his friend Benjamin, planning to steal vegetables from old McGregor's garden. Peter enlists his sisters Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail in the scheme. They discuss and divide the tasks, with Peter collects all the vegetables while Benjamin waits outside. On the other hand, Mopsy is tasked with providing distraction for Peter, he, from the top of a tree. When Peter gives some vegetables to his three sisters, suddenly McGregor arrives with a lawnmower. This surprises Peter, causing him to drop a tomato, alerting McGregor. As McGregor chases Peter, Cottontail distracts him with another tomato. However, a foolish idea comes to Peter's mind, and he pokes McGregor with a carrot, despite Benjamin's protests. McGregor turns, ready to catch Peter. As Peter tries to escape, he gets caught in a trap and forcing Peter to leave his beloved jacket behind. McGregor keeps chasing him, but luckily, B, their kind neighbor, rescues Peter. B is a painter, but her paintings are too abstract and are considered bad. Nevertheless, B continues her hobby. She also paints Peter's family who once lived harmoniously. Unfortunately, everything changed after McGregor came and closed his garden with a wooden fence. Peter's father, who was trying to find food, was eventually killed by McGregor and turned into a rabbit pie. Seeing Peter looking sad, B promises to always be there for him. Back home, Peter spots his jacket in McGregor's garden and resolves to retrieve it. After successfully getting his jacket back, Peter is captured by McGregor, who intends to make rabbit pie. However, McGregor suddenly feels pain and faints and he dies from a heart attack. The scene changes to Peter returning home with lots of vegetables, celebrating their newfound freedom from McGregor's hold. McGregor's death is attributed to his unhealthy lifestyle. The next day, the rabbits mourn him briefly before indulging in the abundance of food. Other animals join in, enjoying the garden's produce. Peter and Benjamin revel in their newfound liberty, dancing and feasting without McGregor's interference. Meanwhile, in London, McGregor's nephew Thomas works at a mall. Thomas is a perfectionist but struggles with abnormal behavior. When McGregor's death is announced, Thomas hopes for a promotion but is disappointed when the position is given to Thomas's colleague named Banner. Thomas pleads with his leader for a change, but it's futile. After that, Banner comes to taunt him, worsening Thomas's despair. Eventually, Thomas is fired by his leader. Meanwhile, as the animals continue their celebration, Peter directs his sisters to hang up a painting of their parents, but his instructions are unclear. At the same time, Thomas receives a package announcing that he has inherited McGregor's house and garden. He decides to visit the village to sell the property. Taking a train and then a taxi, he arrives at McGregor's house. The sight of Thomas scares a goose, prompting all the animals to hide. Thomas cautiously enters the messy house, where he encounters Leslie, a pig, causing both of them to scream before Leslie flees, revealing the presence of the other animals. Thomas rudely drives them away, locking eyes with Peter the rabbit. The next day, Thomas wakes up and cleans the entire house meticulously. Meanwhile, B approaches the rabbits, expressing her surprise at Thomas's seemingly normal behavior. Although the rabbits notice his strange actions, particularly his excessive security measures around the garden, even surpassing McGregor's precautions. B then approaches Thomas, asking him to share the garden's produce with the rabbits. They exchange greetings and Thomas mentions that he'll only be staying temporarily as the house is set to be sold. Peter feels irritated by B's prolonged interaction with Thomas, especially when she gives him a gift of a spyglass. Despite this, B advises Thomas to keep the gate open for the rabbits. Thomas agrees but later locks the gates when he sees the rabbits approaching. Peter and Benjamin boldly climb onto the roof and attempt to walk on cables to reach the food. However, they lose their balance and fall into Thomas' pants. Thomas discovers them and gives chase, leading them into a warehouse. As Thomas searches the pots, Peter manages to escape, but Benjamin cleverly moves between pots, confusing Thomas. After Benjamin successfully tricks Thomas, he emerges with Peter. Unfortunately, Thomas closes the gate, leaving Benjamin trapped inside. Benjamin feigns death, but Thomas warns the rabbits to stop playing with him. Peter grabs Benjamin's jacket and, with his sisters, chases after Thomas's car. Climbing onto the back, Peter instructs Flopsy to cover Thomas's head with a sack, but it keeps blowing away. Then he tells Mopsy to do the same, but the sack flies off again. Running out of sacks, Peter tells Cottontail to what Thomas hears, making him uncomfortable. Seizing the chance, Peter opens the car engine cover, causing Thomas to stop and accidentally trap Peter's ear. Thomas halts at a bridge and prepares to throw Benjamin off, but hesitates when he discovers the spyglass in the sack. 
he drops it and retrieves it, delaying his actions. Shortly after, the rabbits follow Thomas to London as he plans to acquire tools to exterminate them. Thomas receives advice from the store workers on electric fences and explosives, overheard by the rabbits, who manage to annoy him while hiding. Despite their antics, Thomas purchases the tools he needs. Meanwhile, Peter and the others hide under the car, but are tossed off when the wheels spin too fast. Thomas, distracted, nearly hits pedestrians. He encounters Bee and asks her to leave with him. Peter feels jealous seeing Thomas and Bee's closeness. Back home, Bee invites Thomas inside to see her paintings, including one of a rabbit. She admires rabbits for their sincere hearts and demonstrates their apologetic expressions to Thomas, intensifying Peter's jealousy. Following the incident, Bee and Thomas grow closer, spending their days together and seeking shelter from the rain. However, Bee doesn't allow Peter inside her house. Seeing Bee caring for Thomas triggers Peter's emotions. He tries to attack Thomas, but is stopped by Bee, who introduces them. Though Thomas dislikes rabbits, he pretends to like Peter to please Bee. When Bee leaves, Peter attacks Thomas, but they pretend to be friendly when Bee returns. Their fights escalate, damaging Bee's favorite painting. Bee scolds Peter and kicks him out, leaving him sad and Thomas smug for removing his rival from Bee's house. The following day, Peter and the rabbits gear up for revenge on Thomas. They train by crossing rivers, climbing trees, and lifting weights. Meanwhile, Thomas sleeps peacefully, only to wake up to find Peter on his bed. Thomas falls into traps set by Peter, much to Peter's satisfaction. They set up more traps, but Thomas makes it harder by installing electric fences and spreading peanut butter to lure the rabbits. Before long, a hedgehog falls for the trap and gets shocked by the electric fence and shoots his spines towards the rabbits. Despite the danger, Peter doesn't give up. He connects the electric cable to Thomas's house door. Thomas, expecting the rabbits to fall into the trap, watches through his spyglass but sees Peter pretending to be shocked. Confused, Thomas waits, but Peter enjoys the peanut butter without harm. Peter and the other rabbits then enter the garden, dancing around, making Thomas angry because his plan failed. When Thomas tries to leave, he's thrown back by the electricity. Despite trying other doors, Thomas is knocked unconscious when Peter activates the electricity in the attic. Peter feels satisfied that he has eliminated two troublesome figures, McGregor and Thomas. That night, Thomas destroys the electric fence and plants explosives in Peter's house for revenge. Flopsy, realizing Thomas' arrival, wakes up the other rabbits to hide. When Thomas searches for the rabbits, he's surprised by Bee's arrival. He pretends to pick wildflowers for her and is invited into her house. Meanwhile, Peter is determined to remove Thomas from the village. The next day, Peter provokes Thomas to reveal his true nature to Bee. When Thomas is about to strike Peter, Bee intervenes. Despite this, Peter and the rabbits continue to attack Thomas with slingshots. Bee talks to Thomas from afar, unaware of the situation. Thomas obeys her instructions, enduring the attacks. He even chokes on a shot from Flopsy, but manages to regain consciousness with a stun gun. The rabbits believe they have defeated Thomas, but he rises again, grabbing explosives, Peter hopes Bee witnesses Thomas at actions. Unfortunately, Bee is busy painting with loud music playing, so she doesn't hear the explosion. Thomas and Peter resume their intense fight, hurling tomatoes and explosives at each other, catching Bee's attention with the final explosion. Thomas managed to subdue Peter, insisting he wasn't evil and had been trying to change for Bee's sake. He claimed the rabbits constantly provoked him. Bee witnessed Thomas at actions, prompting him to suddenly act kindly towards Peter pretending Peter was choking on food. When Bee asked about the noise, Thomas lied, denying any disturbance. Bee believed him and walked away with Thomas. However, Peter noticed a remote fall from Thomas's pocket and pressed a button, causing an explosion. Realizing she had been deceived, Bee hit Thomas. Another explosion occurred, damaging part of Bee's house. Peter hid the remote, causing Bee to blame Thomas, who defended himself, but Bee didn't believe him. Thomas tried to explain the situation, including the traps set up by the rabbits, but Bee thought he was insane. She invited Peter and the rabbits to stay away from evil people like Thomas. Thomas, feeling sad, confessed his love for Bee and apologized, but she ignored him and left. The argument between Bee and Thomas made Peter feel guilty. Shortly after, Peter approached Bee, who was still sad because she had feelings for Thomas too. Bee had even painted Thomas's face. In the end, Bee decided to move to another town, leaving Peter feeling guilty. Looking at his parents' painting, Peter realized he shouldn't be selfish, desiring Bee's affection without considering Thomas. 
The next day, Thomas returned to London and received an offer to resume his former job, along with a high position. Meanwhile, Peter admitted his mistake in destroying his own house and the relationship between Beat and Thomas. He apologized to the rabbits, but Benjamin didn't accept it, so Peter promised to make amends. He sought help from his sisters to stop B from leaving. Determined to meet Thomas in London, Peter jumped onto a train, with Benjamin joining him. Arriving in London, they asked Mr. Mouse for directions to Peter's workplace. Mr. Mouse kindly showed them around the city before guiding them to the mall where Thomas worked, where he provided them with new clothes and left. Meanwhile, Peter's sisters attempted to prevent B's departure. Peter successfully met with Thomas, but their reunion turned into a fight. Thomas was surprised to learn Peter could talk. Peter urged Thomas to stop B from leaving and promised to help him reconcile with her. Eventually, Thomas agreed, and they left together with Benjamin. The two factions, once at odds, now united to reach B crossing rivers, flying planes, and riding motorcycles. On the flip side, B's taxi was stopped by a deer, who was Peter's ally. Thomas, along with Peter and Benjamin, arrived. Thomas told B about Peter's journey to bring her back. At first, B found it unbelievable, but Thomas assured her it was true. He apologized and expressed his romantic feelings. Though upset, B initially decided to leave anyway. However, Peter revealed the remote in his pocket, proving his guilt. Peter apologized to B, and in that moment, a married couple arrived to buy Thomas's house. Thomas canceled the sale, having reconciled with B. However, the buyers insisted on purchasing the house. Seeing this, the rabbits quickly ran to the house to set up traps. When the man touched the door handle, he was thrown far away, followed by his wife. However, they both seemed undeterred and managed to open the door. Unexpectedly, they were greeted by Leslie and other animals. The couple then left, feeling disgusted by the contents of Thomas's house. Thomas and B finally thanked Peter, and Peter winked, followed by Benjamin and his three siblings, and the Peter Rabbit movie concluded. Moral lesson from the story, if you want to steal vegetables from Gregor's garden, make sure to bring a spare pair of pants because you never know when you might fall into someone else's trousers. And when dealing with a love triangle, don't forget to check your pockets for any remote controls that could explode your chances with the girl you like. The animation begins by showing the year 1976 when AVL agents pursued Bell Bottom, a member of the infamous Vicious Six, for stealing a map of the Zodiac of Antiquity. Bell successfully evades the agents and meets her fellow villains, including Stronghold, Nunchuck, Spengeance, Jean Claude, and Wild Knuckles, at the Vicious Six headquarters. Bell hands over the map to Wild, who opens it and plans to travel to Beijing that night. The following day, Wild arrives in China, where he discovers the location of the Zodiac Stone with the help of the map. Despite slipping and stumbling, Wilde retrieves the stone and is suddenly attacked by guards. With his impressive skills, Wilde defeats the guards and takes the Zodiac Stone. However, soon after taking the stone, a green light enters the Zodiac, and Wilde is met with more guards preparing to chase him. In a desperate attempt to save himself, Wilde contacts his friends to help him. But to his surprise, Belle betrays him and instructs her friends to let Wilde fall after he hands over the Zodiac Stone. The scene shifts to a school where a young Gru attends class. When asked about his aspirations, Gru boldly declares that he wants to be a supervillain. After school, Gru is picked up by his companions, Kevin, Bob, and Stuart, and they embark on a spree of mischievous activities, such as causing a disturbance at the cinema and shooting cheese at people waiting in line for ice cream. Upon arriving home, Gru discovers an invitation to interview for the Vicious Six, who are seeking a replacement for their recently departed member, Wild. Bell explains in the message that Gru is a potential candidate for the position and warns him that the message will explode. However, Gru and the minions fail to leave the car immediately, leading to a small explosion in the vehicle. Later on, Gru meets with his mother to ask for food, but as it's not yet ready, he heads to his secret base to gather the minions and share the news of his interview with the Vicious Six. The minions are elated to hear this. In his room adorned with Vicious Six posters, Gru lays down to sleep, dreaming of joining the infamous group. However, Kevin and the other minions soon join him, leaving Gru with little space in his own bed. Meanwhile, a news program on the villain's TV reports on the Vicious Six's plan to harness the power of the Zodiac Stone during the Chinese New Year and defeat the AVL, making them the most powerful villains on Earth. Wild, who had been betrayed by his teammates, watches the news with evident displeasure. His men soon arrive, asking for payment, but Wild refuses and engages in a fight with them. He quickly overpowers them all. The morning of Gru's big interview with the Vicious Six had finally arrived and he was eager to impress. As he was getting dressed, his loyal minions waited for him outside, hoping to join him on his adventure. However, Gru refused to let them come along, and so they followed him in secret. 
When Gru arrived at the Vicious Six headquarters, he nervously mentioned the secret code that Bell had given him to a guard named Dr. Nefario. The guard listened intently and then took Gru to a room where he handed him a cassette tape. While Gru played the tape, his minions watched from outside the window, eager to know what was happening. As Gru listened to the tape, Nefario instructed him to play it backward, revealing a hidden message that only someone with a keen mind could decipher. Impressed by Gru's intelligence, Nefario decided to give him a tool that he had created for free. Upon arrival at the Vicious Six headquarters, Gru is excited about his interview to become a supervillain. However, he was met with immediate ridicule and insults from the other candidates, including Bell who suggested that Gru should go back to school. This only fueled Gru's determination to prove himself. During the interview, Gru attempted to steal the Zodiac Stone to demonstrate his villainous potential. His theft was noticed by the new Bell, who immediately ordered Stronghold to destroy the bridge Gru crossed. Despite this, Gru managed to cross the destroyed bridge and make it upstairs to encounter Nefario. Nefario recognized Gru's potential and allowed him to leave with the Zodiac Stone. As Gru made his way out of the building, he was spotted by Wilde who was amazed that a child could pull off such a daring heist. After Gru got to where his bike was parked, he sees the minions and asks them to get ready to leave. Svengeance chases after Gru, and during the chase, Gru's bike slips, and Otto falls while holding the Zodiac Stone. Gru asks Otto to take the stone to headquarters while he and the others distract the vicious six members. Gru manages to defeat Stronghold, Nunchuck, and Jane Claude all at once while Belle arrives and hooks her chain to Gru's bike. Gru ignites the rocket on the bike and escapes from the Vicious Six. After some time passes, Gru becomes anxious because Otto has not returned with the Zodiac Stone. He tells the minions that he will return the stone to Belle once she recognizes his power and recruits him to be a member of Vicious Six. Eventually, Otto returns with an ordinary stone instead of the Zodiac Stone. Gru becomes upset and fires the minions, determined to find the Zodiac Stone on his own. As Gru packs his things to leave, he is suddenly kidnapped by Wild. Kevin, one of the minions, tries to chase after Wilde's car, but his efforts are in vain. The next day after Wilde's mission, Gru meets with him and is shocked to hear that Wilde has been killed while taking the Zodiac Stone. However, Wilde explains that he was disrespectfully removed from the Vicious Six and asks Gru for help to give the new Zodiac sign. Gru, who had lost the Zodiac Stone, shows the displayed stone from Otto. Feeling played, Wilde orders his men to throw Gru off his house, but Gru begs to call his house first. Once connected, Kevin receives the call, and Wilde tells him that he is waiting for the Zodiac sign at his home in San Francisco. If they don't carry the Zodiac sign within two days, Gru will die a terrible death. Panicked that Gru's life is at stake, Kevin orders the other minions to interrogate Otto for information on the man who had traded the Zodiac Stone. After being threatened, Otto finally remembers and mentions the boy's characteristics. The minions then decide to meet the boy who lived near Gru's house. When they get to the front of the house, Kevin, Stuart, and Bob meet the boy while Otto is ordered to stay in front of the house. Suddenly, the garage of the house opens and Otto accidentally notices the biker, the uncle of the boy who took the Zodiac Stone, is about to leave while wearing the Zodiac Stone. Otto immediately chases the biker using a mini bicycle, afraid of losing track. Kevin and his friends had failed to obtain the Zodiac Stone to save Gru and were in a hurry to reach San Francisco. They hopped on a bus with a San Francisco sign and took off without any plan or preparation. Meanwhile, Vicious Six, led by Bell, was gearing up to attack Gru's house. When Kevin and his friends reached the airport, they found out that they couldn't fly to San Francisco without proper documentation. They observed how easily the pilots and flight attendants could enter and decided to disguise themselves as pilots and a flight attendant to get on board. Kevin tried to learn the plane's flight system while Stuart played with the microphone in the control room, and Bob served the passengers in disguise. Kevin's adherence to the guidebook led to a heated argument between him and Stuart, who eventually pressed all the buttons in the cockpit to take off abnormally. After a lot of struggles, Kevin took over and stabilized the flight. On the flight, Stuart left the cockpit feeling nauseous while Kevin activated the autopilot and went to sleep. Bob, on the other hand, was comforting a crying baby passenger. As they approached the San Francisco airport, alarms sounded, and Kevin woke up to turn off the autopilot and land the plane safely. Gru finds himself captive in a dimly lit room belonging to Wild. With ropes tightly bound around his arms, Wild explains that unless the Zodiac Stone is delivered within 48 hours, Gru will meet a gruesome fate. Meanwhile, Otto continues to chase the biker, unaware of the distance he has covered through several cities. Kevin and his team have finally tracked down Wild's hideout. However, they have a long way to go before they can reach it. Along the way, Bob falls and gets stuck in a carriage. Kevin and Stuart, not wanting to leave Bob behind, jump on the carriage to join him. 
When they finally reach the destination, they come face to face with many of Wilde's henchmen who are guarding the entrance. Kevin suggests going undercover, but their disguises fail, and they are chased until they end up cornered in the Chinatown area. When the guards beat the three minions, Mater Chow, a former kung fu teacher, witnesses the entire scene from her acupuncture clinic. She can't bear to see a young child beaten up and decides to intervene. Chow unleashes her martial arts skills and single-handedly takes down all of Wilde's guards. With the minions battered and bruised, Kevin and his team are desperate for a way to save Gru. They enter Chow's acupuncture clinic and beg her to teach them kung fu so they can rescue Gru. Chow initially refuses, but after seeing Bob's pitiful face, she finally agrees to train them. The scene turns to Gru's house where the minions are ordered by Gru's mother, Marlena, to sell kitchen utensils. However, their peaceful day is suddenly interrupted by the arrival of the vicious six, who attack Gru's house in an attempt to find him. One of the minions is threatened by Belle, a member of Vicious Six, to reveal Gru's whereabouts. The minion reveals that Gru has been kidnapped by Wilde, which surprises the Vicious Six team as they thought Wilde was dead. They immediately head to San Francisco to meet Wilde. Meanwhile, Kevin and the other minions are seen practicing with Mater Chow, a former kung fu teacher. They start with basic exercises like practicing against a doll and destroying wood. However, Stuart and Kevin are not serious about practicing, which results in Chow hitting them both. At Wilde's house, his men ask to retire after being beaten by Chow. Feeling lonely, Wilde decides to free Gru, saying that he has great potential to become a supervillain. At the same time, Otto, who had been chasing the rider, finally gets his hands on the Zodiac Stone. The rider even gives Otto a ride to San Francisco. In the meantime, Gru is trying to clean his pool, which is full of crocodiles. He is confused about how to do it and asks Wilde to show him. Wilde jumps into the pool and is quickly attacked by the crocodiles, but Gru saves him. Wilde acknowledges Gru's bravery and agrees to teach him how to become a supervillain. In the middle of the forest, Kevin and his two colleagues train with Chow who teaches them internal power techniques. Chow practices the technique with Stuart, who bounces far through several trees. The minions train hard day after day until Chow declares that they are ready to save Gru. Gru and Wilde then team up to rob the Bank of Evil which is oddly located in a public toilet. Inside, they encounter Mr. Perkins, and to distract him, Wilde feigns illness while Gru heads upstairs to the safe. Gru manages to retrieve the object inside, but the safe requires a key that is in Perkins' back pocket. With the help of a tool provided by Nefario, Gru successfully retrieves the key, just in time to stop Perkins from using a heartburn device on Wilde. Gru reveals that his grandfather is safe and decides to leave the bank. Outside, he reveals to Wilde that he has managed to steal the Mona Lisa, which makes Wilde happy. Meanwhile, Kevin and the other minions arrive at Wilde's house to help Gru, but they find it empty. Belle and her crew also arrive, ransacking the place when they find no one there. Kevin, realizing that the Vicious Six might know Gru's whereabouts, decides to follow Belle and her team. Otto arrives in San Francisco and lands in Chinatown before saying goodbye to the rider. After returning home, Gru and Wilde are devastated to find that their house has been destroyed by Vicious Six, the team that Wilde had formed himself. Although Wilde had taught them how to be supervillains, they had now turned against him and destroyed his home. Wilde is furious with Vicious Six, but Gru is even more enraged and declares that he will face them. However, Wilde disagrees and instead expels Gru from his team. Feeling disappointed and alone, Gru decides to board a train to clear his head. To his surprise, he runs into Otto on the train, who gives him the Zodiac Stone that he had obtained. But their peaceful journey is cut short when the members of Vicious Six suddenly appear and capture Gru to get their hands on the stone, while Otto decides to hide. Meanwhile, the AVL agents have surrounded the location and are waiting to take action. As the Chinese New Year's Eve begins, Belle decides to make her move and challenge all the AVL agents with the Zodiac Stone she holds. The stone's power transforms Belle and her minions into powerful monsters, who easily defeat the AVL agents. Meanwhile, Gru is captured and tied up in a giant clock, while Kevin and the others are turned into helpless animals. In the midst of this chaos, Wilde unexpectedly appears, seeking revenge on the Vicious Six and saving his disciple Gru. The minions join Wilde in the fight, and with their help, Kevin and the others are able to unleash their hidden powers and fight back against the monsters. Just as the battle seems to be turning in their favor, Gru is still trapped in the giant clock, struggling to break free. But Otto arrives to save him, and they fight together to free Gru from his bombs. At the same time, Belle unleashes a powerful fire attack on Wilde, leaving him helpless on the ground. With Gru next, in line for her wrath, Kevin and his friends tap into their inner power and rush to protect him. As they fight, Gru manages to grab hold of the Zodiac Stone 
causing Belle and her minions to shrink down into tiny animals. With the vicious six defeated and captured, Wilde is rushed to the hospital to receive medical attention for his injuries. Despite the destruction caused by the minions, Gru decides not to fire them and instead offers them a heartfelt apology for his actions. As the dust settles, the AVL leader arrives on the scene and questions whether Wilde should be imprisoned for his involvement with the vicious six. A few days after the battle with vicious six, Gru and the minions are gathered to mourn the loss of Wilde. While paying their respects, Gru sees Wilde hiding behind a tree, hinting that he faked his death to evade punishment and erase his criminal record with the AVL. Gru and Wilde then walk away from the funeral, leaving the minions behind. Later, Gru decides to recruit Nefario as his evil scientist to assist with his evil plans. Initially reluctant, Nefario rejects the offer. However, after some persuasion from Gru and the minions, Nefario agrees to join the team. They then leave on a plane that Nefario has built. As the animation comes to a close, Gru, Wild, Nefario, and the minions are seen heading toward their next evil mission. The moral of the story is that even if you're a supervillain, it's important to have friends and family who will stand by you and help you defeat your enemies, especially if they have zodiac stones that turn them into powerful monsters. When facing a powerful villain, don't forget to bring your inner power back to life, but also don't forget to bring your favorite teddy bear for- Hi, welcome to Prime Recap. After an accident, the musician ends up having his soul separated from his body, and in order to come back to life, he assumes the form of a cat and will have to face a journey together with his newest partner, an obscure soul. Today we will recap the story of the 2020 movie Soul. Joe is a man with a passion for music, but despite this, he has never been able to support himself by playing concerts. To make some money, Joe works as a part-time teacher in a public school, but since his students are all teenagers, none of them are really getting into music, which makes him even more frustrated with his life. One day while teaching one more of his classes, Joe is called by the principal who tells him that from now on he will be hired to work full-time on a contract, but instead of being happy, this makes Joe very thoughtful. After presenting all the classes, Joe goes to his mother's sewing store to tell her about the promotion, but instead of asking what he wants to do, Libba pressures her son to take the job and give up his dream with concerts, forcing Joe to promise that he will do it. But just as he gives his answer, Curly, a former student of Joe's, calls to tell him that he is working in the band of Dorothea Williams, one of the greatest jazz singers in the entire country. Curly also says that the group's pianist has quit, so they need a new replacement. Extremely excited about the opportunity, Joe rushes to the theater to take the test, but upon realizing that he is only a high school teacher, Dorothea belittles him and says she doesn't want to waste her time. Even after this, Joe goes to the piano and the test begins, but since Dorothea doesn't say which song it is to play, Joe starts to observe the notes that the girl with the cello is making and replicates the chords on the piano. Realizing that Joe was able to interpret the song, Dorothea lets him do a solo to demonstrate his skills, but while playing, Joe gives himself completely to the music, shutting off from the outside world for a few seconds. When Joe comes to his senses, Dorothea says it was not bad at all and asks him to put on his best suit and come back to rehearsal at 7 o'clock at night. Excited, Joe leaves the theater extremely happy and celebrates his achievement while walking home, because of his excitement, he gets distracted and doesn't see an open manhole in the middle of the street, falling all the way down the hole. Some time later, Joe regains consciousness and realizes that he is on a treadmill that leads straight to a large light source. In fear, Joe runs in the opposite direction where he meets other people who explain that they are no longer alive, and that by going into the light, they will go to the the great beyond. In a state of denial, Joe says he can't miss Dorothea's concert and starts walking in the other direction, but as he realizes that the approaching souls are pulled by the light, he starts running completely panicked in the middle of the crowd. As there are many souls on the treadmill, Joe climbs up on the spirits and runs around stepping on their heads, but in desperation, he decides to jump off the treadmill, crossing a protective barrier and falling through several dimensions until he reaches a clearing of blue grass. When he gets up, Joe sees that he is surrounded by thousands of other souls and tries to hide, but is soon met by little spirits who run to play with him. As soon as he notices the presence of a stranger, the being responsible for caring for the little souls appears before Joe and explains that they are in the great before, the area where unborn spirits are prepared for human life. Still quite confused, Joe asks for the name of the spirit, who says that everyone responsible for the great before is called Jerry. As he is in the world of souls, Joe asks if he has really lost his life, and Jerry replies that he hasn't yet. For although his spirit is already there, his body is still in a waiting mode. In order to show Joe around, Jerry transforms himself into a sort of mount and begins to introduce him to the pavilions, as well as the portal that leads to Earth. As soon as he sees the portal, Joe gets off his mount and runs straight into the hole to throw himself in with the other souls, but for some reason, 
Every time he is approaching the earth, he is pulled back into the grate before. Confused, Joe stands in front of the portal until he is met by another Jerry, who, believing him to be a soul mentor, takes him to a line and asks him to get a badge. Since he doesn't know what he's talking about, Joe refuses to get in line and says he needs to leave, however when Jerry shows that the only place he can go is to the the great beyond, Joe changes his mind, grabs some random person's badge and heads off to mentor training. At that moment, the soul counter who stands in the passage to the the great beyond realizes that she has a missing soul and goes to the great before Jerry to report what has happened. Determined to solve the problem, the counter goes to the register room and starts checking all the millions of sheets one by one, willing to stop only when she finds out who is missing. In the mentor class, the instructor explains that all the souls that are in the great before will one day go to earth, but for this, they need to form their personality and find out what they like. After the great before souls have formed their tastes, there is a gap left to fill, which is each one's spark. And this is exactly where mentors must act, helping spirits to discover their spark. As the lecture ends, Jerry appears and says it's time to bring the mentors and soul partners together, and starts calling for Dr. Borgensen. Since it is not his name, Joe just stands there clapping, until he realizes that the badge he stole is from this doctor and that he needs to go on stage to maintain his cover. To be Joe's soul partner, Jerry calls number 22 to the stage, a very old spirit who has had mentors such as Muhammad Ali, Marie Antoinette, and Nikolaus Copernicus, but despite this, has never been able to find his spark and therefore refuses to go to Earth. With both introduced, Jerry drops the 22 in Joe's face and opens the portal to the Hall of U Dimension, a mysterious place that shows the most important moments of the mentor's life. In this place, 22 asks Joe to give up and go to the Great Beyond, but since he needs the badge that is on her chest, he reveals that he is not Dr. Borgensen and shows the highlights of his life. But unlike other people, all the highlights of Joe's life are failures, both in his music career and in his personal life. While walking through his memories, Joe finds his unconscious body on a hospital gurney and asks for the badge of the 22 so he can return to Earth, but she explains that no matter what she tries, the badge will remain attached to her soul until it becomes a pass. Knowing that she does not want to be born, Joe proposes to help 22 turn the badge into a pass. With that done, she must deliver the object so he can return to Earth, which makes her a free spirit that can stay in the world of souls forever. To try to discover 22's spark, Joe decides to take her to the Hall of Everything, a place that as the name implies, has all the things in the world for great before souls to experience and discover their inspirations. In this place, Joe tries to show 22 the pleasures of food, but since they are in the spirit world, they lack touch, smell, and taste, therefore, they are not able to feel anything physical. After this first failure, Joe takes the 22 into various activities, such as putting out fires, painting pictures, and doing artistic gymnastics, but none of it works out and they leave the room of everything completely disappointed. Outside, a Jerry shows up to say that Joe's time is up and it's time for him to go to the great beyond, but knowing that if that happens another mentor will come to try to get her to go to Earth, 22 begs Jerry to give them both more time. At her request, Jerry leaves while 22 guides Joe to a secret passage that leads to a place where people who are still alive can access it. On the other side, 22 explains that this is the place where people go when they are on hallucinogenic or extremely inspired, and Joe realizes that this is the place where he ended up when he was doing the test with Dorothea. While observing the surrounding landscape, Joe sees some creatures wandering in the desert until one of them notices their presence and starts chasing them. With nowhere to run, the two are trapped against a rock until suddenly, a giant ship appears and traps the creature with some sort of containment net. After stopping the boat, Captain Moon Wind disembarks, greets 22, and introduces himself to Joe. It is revealed that 22 has come to this place only to find this being. With the introductions made, Moon Wind asks his crew to release the lost soul and return it home. To do this, the crew members begin to perform a ritual that takes away all the creature's anxiety and obsession, causing it to become an ordinary soul again. With that done, one of the crew takes the moon wind staff and draws a circle on the ground, opening a portal that allows the spirit to return to its body. Excited by what he sees, Joe takes the staff and draws a circle in the earth, but instead of opening a portal to his body, it opens a passage to the great beyond. Now Joe's soul is becoming increasingly disconnected from his body. To try to re-establish the connection between the soul and the body, moon wind draws a large circle on the ground and asks Joe to focus on his own body until he locates it, revealing that he is on a hospital gurney. As soon as he sees the scene, Joe tries desperately to jump back into his body, but in the midst of the confusion he ends up dropping 22 along with him into the human world. This was a terrible mistake, for when they arrive on Earth, 22 possesses his body while Joe invades the body of the hospital's pet cat. 
When the doctors enter the room, Joe tries to tell the staff what has happened, but since he is in the body of a cat, the only thing they can hear is the cat meowing. Since 22 is the only one who can communicate with humans, Joe begins to dictate what she should say, but upon hearing the story about the School of Souls in corporeal exchange, the doctors think it is a side effect of the medications and put him under observation. With 10 minutes left before the doctors take the cat away, Joe proposes to escape from the hospital and find the human version of the Moonwind, but since she has never controlled a body before, 22 struggles a lot before she can really walk. Even though Joe and 22 can't walk properly, they go into stealth mode and manage to get out of the hospital unnoticed, but when they arrive outside, her souls freeze completely as she see all the noise and chaos of New York City. Realizing that she has paralyzed, Joe tries to get her attention to make her move, but the man ends up scratching 22 who, feeling pain for the first time, runs in complete panic. Desperate, Joe begins to search for the soul until he finds her sitting in an alley quite frightened. To calm her down, Joe takes a slice of pizza from a store and hands it to 22, who is delighted to smell and taste the pizza for the first time. Now with their stomachs full, 22 calms down and they continue on their mission to find Moonwind, which doesn't take long to happen. As soon as they find the man, 22 runs up to him and starts swinging him around, bringing him out of his astral journey and back to Earth. When he realizes that Joe and 22 are there, the Moonwind says that in order to exchange bodies, they need to wait until a new hole between the Earth and the astral plane opens up, which will only happen at 6.30. With nothing to do until that time, Joe and 22 try to order a taxi home, but as they are getting into the vehicle, they end up being seen by Dorothea. At home, Joe starts planning what to do, and gets a call from Curly, who says that after seeing him in hospital clothes in the middle of the street, Dorothea has given up on hiring him and called someone else to play. But to comfort him, Curly tells him to put on his best suit and go to the theater so that he will try to convince her to change her mind. Happy that he still has a chance, Joe tells 22 to put on his suit, but at that moment, Connie, a student of Joe's, shows up at the door to tell him that she is giving up music because it is a waste of time. Agreeing with the girl, 22 locks Joe inside the apartment and stands outside encouraging Connie to give up both music and school, but upon seeing the girl's skills with the trombone, 22 is moved and advises her to keep going after her dream. Finding it strange what she felt when he saw Connie playing, 22 decides to give human life a chance and have new experiences, such as taking a hot bath and brushing her teeth. With her soul satisfied, Joe asks her to put on his best suit and tries to cut her hair, but since he is in a cat's body, he ends up messing up and putting a hole in her hair. Knowing that he cannot perform with this mess in his head, Joe takes 22 to the barber who manages to give her a new look, perfect for the big performance. But while 22 is getting her hair cut, the counter finally finds Joe's file and realizes that his soul has come back to Earth. To solve this problem, she goes to the hospital and starts tracking them down until she finds Joe and 22 leaving the barbershop. But while trying to capture them, the thing ends up taking the soul of an innocent person, leaving him completely traumatized. Unaware that the counter is behind them, Joe and 22 walk calmly to the place they have arranged to meet the moon wind, but halfway there, 22 bends down to pick up an object and ends up tearing Joe's pants. With no other options, the man decides to take her to his mother's sewing store to have the pants mended, but knowing that she will not be happy to know that she will use the clothes to perform a concert, he asks her to lie. But as soon as they arrive at the sewing store, everyone already knows about the presentation with Dorothea, including his mother. Upon entering her office, 22 shows her the rip and asks if Libba can fix it, but she refuses to help and fights with her son for throwing away the opportunity of a steady job. Upset, Joe complains that his mother never supported him and calls 22 to leave, but thinking it is to repeat the phrase, she ends up telling everything he said. Finally understanding how her son feels, Libba regrets not having supported him and decides to give her late husband's favorite suit to Joe. After some adjustments to his father's suit, Joe is finally ready for the concert and walks to the theater to meet Moon Wind, but while they wait, 22 sees a father playing with his daughter and begins to reflect on her experiences on Earth, making her realize that she has changed her mind and now wants to live among humans. At 6.30 p.m. sharp, the Moon Wind arrives in front of the theater and begins to prepare for the ritual, but afraid of going back to the school of life and never being able to experience these sensations again, the 22 refuses to leave Joe's body and begins to run away. Wanting his body back, Joe starts chasing her to the subway, but the counter finally finds them and takes advantage of an empty stretch of the station to open a portal to the world of souls. In the other plane, the counter separates the duo's souls from their bodies and brings them back to the great before, where Joe and 22 start a big fight, but the Jerrys interrupt the two when they realize that the soul has finally managed to turn her badge into a pass, meaning she has finally found her spark. Confused, 
22 starts to wonder what the spark is, until Joe shouts in a totally rude way saying that she only got the pass because she was living his life as an intruder. Realizing the level the discussion is reaching, Jerry interrupts the two and asks Joe to take 22 to the portal to Earth. When she reaches the edge of the portal, 22 is extremely upset by what Joe said and throws the pass at his head, disappearing into the midst of the souls. Instead of going after her, Joe goes to a Jerry to ask what her spark was, but in response, he explains that we don't need purpose or reasons to exist, and that the spark is just wanting to be alive. Still not understanding what he meant, Joe takes the pass and jumps through the portal, returning to his body that was lying in the middle of the station. Upon regaining consciousness, Joe rushes to the theater, breaks into Dorothea's dressing room, and manages to convince her to give him a chance. With his problem solved, Joe goes on stage and performs with the band, winning over the audience and making official his position as Dorothea's new pianist. After the concert, Joe begins to feel empty and asks Dorothea what comes next, but she replies by saying just more performances, one day after another. Disappointed that his dream has come true and yet nothing has changed in his life, Joe begins to reflect on his entire journey and realizes that none of it was worth it, but as he remembers what Jerry said about the spark, he realizes that 22 really wanted to be alive. As a way of making amends for his mistakes, Joe goes home and starts playing the piano in a very inspired way, causing him to go to the astral plane. In the spirit world, Joe meets with Moon Wind and tells him that he needs to find 22, but he tells him that she has become a lost soul. Determined to save her, Joe asks the help of Moon Wind so that together they can bring her back. Moon Wind then starts sailing until he finds the spirit of the 22 and asks Joe to trap it with the net, but as soon as it is captured, the lost soul begins to dig down until it sinks the ship, causing Moon Wind to return to Earth. When she returns to the surface, 22 starts running around in desperation until she feels trapped and decides to flee to the Great Before. Seeing a lost soul loose in the Great Before, the counter tries to make her stop but is easily immobilized by 22. In fear, the soul continues running wildly around the place while hurling various spirits at Joe, but she eventually gets distracted and is cornered by the Jerrys at the portal to Earth. Now that the 22 finally stopped, Joe takes the opportunity to try to talk to her and give her the pass back, but he ends up getting too close and getting eaten up. Inside the lost soul, Joe sees all the times that 22 was humiliated by her mentors and discovers that she never discovered her spark precisely because of the anxiety she felt. Completely sorry for everything he said, the man finally manages to get around all the bad feelings and reaches 22 in the center of the storm, freeing his friend from all the bad feelings. Now that the soul has finally returned to consciousness, Joe returns the pass and accompanies her as she leaps through the portal. When the 22 finally falls into the world of the living, Joe is pulled back and teleported to the treadmill of the great beyond, but just as he is ready to turn himself in, one of the Jerry's shows up to thank him for what Joe has done and tells him that they have decided to give him another chance to live. Back in his body, Joe learns his lesson and starts to enjoy every second of his life. So, what did you think of this movie?